My name's Tamara Davis, and I am an astrophysicist. Now, when I pulled that line out at the pub, uh, when, <laughs> when in response to the typical, you know, so what do you do for a living sort of question, there's usually a moment of stunned silence, uh, but after that, it goes, really? That's awesome. And then we descend into about two hours of discussion of the universe. You know, where's the center? Where's the edge? What are black holes? Is there life out there? And uh, we, yeah, you know, that, that's the rest of the evening gone. Um, but that's one of the things that I love about being an astrophysicist, that it's something that so many people are so curious about. But during those conversations, it inevitably gets to the point where someone goes, but what do you actually do? So that's what I wanted to cover a little bit in this talk, give you a sense of why we would bother to do astrophysics and the kinds of things that it would, that it would teach us. So to do that, let's start here. <laughs> now, I uh, can't believe how nerdily excited I was when I actually got to go and visit this instrument earlier this year. This is the Large Hadron Collider. It is one of the biggest experiments that humankind has ever built, a 27 kilometer around ring, around which people uh, may accelerate particles to close to the speed of light, bash them together, and from the shrapnel, figure out the nuts and bolts of what matter is made of. Now, this instrument, I have not yet got to visit. Um, <laughs> it's the Hubble Space Telescope. And with this and the many other telescopes that we have around the world, both on the ground and in space, we're trying to answer many of the same questions that the Large Hadron Collider is trying to solve. We also want to answer the fundamental questions about how physics works here on Earth. Now, why would you go to space to try and look at that when you have the opportunity to you know, do experiments here on the ground? Well, despite the fact that the Large Hadron Collider is a 27 kilometer around ring, it is still only a 27 kilometer around ring on a much bigger planet, which surrounds a much bigger star with nuclear furnaces going off in the center, which is just one of 300 billion stars in our galaxy, which is just one of billions of galaxies in the universe. Now, the universe naturally puts on experiments on time scales, length scales, and energies that we can never even possibly hope to replicate here on Earth, even in principle. So that's why we look at the physics at the most extreme to try and understand better the physics that works here on Earth. Now, uh, pro we have a long history of actually sort of revealing fundamental physics using astrophysics from the laws of gravity as we understood how planets orbited to the nuclei of atoms when we understood how stars burned. But progress had been pretty slow until recently. The advent of digital cameras on enormous telescopes has given an absolute avalanche of data that has completely revolutionized our view of the world. Now, if we could dim the lights, I have a video that gives the um, impression of just how far modern telescopes can see. So I'm not sure if it's possible to make it dark, because this is really cool. So it starts off with a, a little pretend supernova going off in a distant galaxy, but then it turns to a real image from the Hubble Space Telescope. And we zoom out from that, and as that happens, it gets superimposed on other images from other wider field telescopes. And we zoom out, and we zoom out. These are all real images, all in the right part of the space. And we zoom out, and we zoom out, and eventually you get to a point where there might be something you recognize. Now, that is the most visceral sort of demonstration I can give of just how far away these stars are that we can see, or these galaxies that we can see. Uh, it's difficult to really give a good impression. This is another image from the Hubble Space Telescope. And the thing with this is that uh, the most distant galaxies in this are really far away. The best way I can demonstrate that is by talking about time. So, the time it takes for light to travel from my face to your eyes in this room is so small as to seem instantaneous, but you are seeing me as I was a fraction of a second ago. When we look at the sun, we see that as it was 8.2 minutes ago. When we look at the nearest star, four years ago. Our nearest galaxy, big one, Andromeda, uh, we see that as it was 25 million years ago. That means when that was emitting the light that we're now seeing, 
our ancestors were just first learning to use tools. But that's the nearest galaxy. In this photo, you can see galaxies that emitted the light we're now seeing 12 billion years ago, not million, billion. To put that in perspective, our Earth is four and a half billion years old. So the light that we're seeing here was emitted before the Earth even formed. Now, when you're the person sitting there at the telescope and that light comes in, I can tell you it is an awe-inspiring experience and massively exciting. I remember sitting back at the telescope just going, Whoa, that's, that's amazing when I first saw that. But anyway, uh, with this sort of observing power, <laughs> With this sort of observing power, we now have a really good picture of what is going on in the universe. It started out with some sort of hot big bang, expanded. In, in that midst of that expansion, galaxies formed, planets formed, we crawled out, and here we are. So, simple picture. But it also has given us a couple of curiosities. For example, galaxies are spinning too fast. If I like spin something around above my head, I know exactly how much force I need to pull to stop it from flying away. When it was first able to measure the spin of galaxies in the 70s, we measured the spin and every single one is going too fast. In order to be able to hold themselves together, there must be 10 times as much mass in that galaxy as we can see in the stars and gas. Now, there'd been hints of it before, but that's the first real solid evidence that dark matter exists. Not only that, ever since Hubble in 1929 announced that the, expand, that the universe was expanding, people had been asking, is, it gonna, is gravity going to slow it down enough to stop it and make it recollapse, or will it expand forever? So the question basically goes like this. Like, if I throw this up in the air, it comes back down into my hand. But if I take this and hurl it up at 11 kilometers per second, then in the absence of air resistance and a ceiling, uh, this would escape off into space and never come back. So that was the question, do galaxies have the escape velocity or is there enough gravity to pull them back in? It wasn't until the 90s that the technology became good enough to be able to measure this, and that was done using supernovae. Now, this has been, how this is done has been talked about a lot lately, so I'm not going to go in it, into it in any detail. I'm going to move straight to the punchline. And that's that when you, the measurement was actually able to be made, the discovery was that the, neither of the above is happening. The, neither of those options is happening. What's happening is the expansion is not slowing down at all. It's speeding up. Now, that is as strange as me taking this pointer, throwing it in the air, and watching it accelerate off into space. Something's going on out there that has anti-gravity. Something is pushing, not pulling. We don't know what it is, but we call it dark energy. With these two pieces of the puzzle, we actually got to a point where now we've realized that the stuff that makes up you and I only makes up about 5% of the total stuff that's out there. So that's a pretty bold statement. So how could I justify you know, believing in so much stuff that we can't see? Well, I skipped over those quickly because those are just actually the tips of the icebergs for the evidence that we now have for dark matter and dark energy. Uh, and it's to that more complex and sort of subtle stuff that I want to go now. It's a bit of a challenge, so I'm going to see if I can uh, express the really cool other stuff that's going on. Now, if the universe is expanding now, the logical conclusion of that is that everything has to be being closer together in the past. When you put things close together, you compress them, and when something gets compressed, it gets hot. That means that the Big Bang Theory makes a prediction, that the universe used to be hot and dense, and if that's the case, it has to have been glowing, you know, hot things glow, and the light from that should still be travelling through the universe today, and we should be able to see it. Now, the strength of a good theory is one that it explains something, like the expanding universe, uh, but it also predicts something else that you can test. If you can then go and check that prediction and find that it's true, you have a lot of confidence that your theory is the right one. So, that brings us to these guys. Here we have Penzias and Wilson. Uh, in the 60s, they were there busily scrubbing the bird crap out of their telescope because they were trying to get rid of this annoying static that they just had in every single image, no matter which way they looked in the sky. Now, little did they know that their efforts would be futile because it wasn't the bird crap that they were seeing, it was actually the leftover radiation from the Big Bang. 
This was the first detection of the, what's now known as the cosmic microwave background. And even though they sort of found it a little bit accidentally, they did win the Nobel Prize for that in 1978. <laughs> um, now, that was, the, that was the first of two Nobel Prizes that have gone for the cosmic microwave background. The second went to a team called, the leaders of a team called COBE, the Cosmic Background Explorer. That was a space telescope that flew in the 80s and, it, uh, and into the 90s, and it mapped the entire microwave background across the entire sky. And the thing that they saw that no one had ever seen before are uh, little tiny fluctuations in the temperature in different regions of the sky. This spot was slightly different temperature to that spot. Barely detectable, but there. And believe it or not, that actually confirmed another prediction of our model of the universe. Now, you may have heard that sound doesn't travel in space. Well, that wasn't always true. If you go back to the very early universe, when everything was hot and dense, sound was traveling everywhere, because basically it was just like one big continuous bit of gas. If you, now this next bit, I think, is probably the most amazing thing I'll tell you in this talk. So, 30 seconds of concentration on this. <laughs> if, if you start from completely random fluctuations, the kind of little things that quantum physics says should have been there at the beginning of the universe, then you apply the same physics that I would use to describe the sound waves that travel from my mouth or the speakers to your ears in this room, you can calculate how sound would travel in that early universe um, as that gas expanded. When you do that, you see that patterns start emerging the patterns determined by how far that sound can travel. Those patches that they were seeing is the imprint of those early sound waves. I think it's amazing that we can go back, we can predict that we should see fluctuations in this radiation from the Big Bang, then we can go and build a space telescope, go out and actually see what we predicted. I think that's amazing, and that was the second Nobel Prize that went to the cosmic microwave background. Now, two satellites have gone since that then. This one here, that you can see that sort of colour in the background, that's the WMAP satellite showing the hot and cold spots. Uh, and this year, uh, another satellite just released their results. That one was called Planck. And during the Planck press release, I hosted a party at my place for all the astro people who wanted to come <laughs> over and watch the results come out live. Um, <laughs> And I'm only going to show you one plot in this talk, but this has to be it, because when I saw this, I literally gasped. <laughs> God, don't you see? So what this is, this is actually quantifying those fluctuations you see. The blue dots are the data. The red curve is the model. Now, that model is a model that basically has the amount of dark matter that rotating galaxies should, said should be there, the amount of dark energy that supernovae said should be there. And if you took those bits out of the model, you wouldn't be able to fit this data at all. So that's some, we've been able to see these sound waves and confirm that dark matter and dark energy exist using the, this microwave background. And so I think this is a beautiful piece of data. And to compare the, the sort of state of the art in 1997, when this was first uh, like, you know, when I first sort of started getting interested in this, that was the, that was the data that we had then. So, a lot has happened in the last little while. But that is not all. There is more. If you take these hot spots and cold spots, they're dense spots and under-dense spots. Dense spots are where galaxies would eventually form. Take that, let it evolve over time, galaxies form in the, in the dense spots. Now, we can make the prediction of what we would see. If there's a pattern in that microwave background, we should see a pattern in the galaxies too. And we've done that. Here is a simulation done in the computer of what you would expect to see. So starting out from those really smooth backgrounds with tiny little fluctuations, you see just under the effects of gravity, structure starts to form. Clumps form where galaxies would form. Galaxies fall together and form this massive cluster of galaxies that's in the center. Now, I returned to Australia in 2008 to join a team called Wiggles uh, to look for these wiggles in the galaxies. We measured uh, over 200,000 galaxies in a five-year survey, uh, measured their distribution, and in the distribution of those galaxies, we saw the imprint of the sound waves of the early universe. That is a massive confirmation that our picture of the universe is actually true. And again, you need dark energy and dark matter to show this. 
So I hope that I've given you a couple of sort of a, a couple of whirlwind things, not the standard explanations for dark matter and dark energy, but some of the reasons we're so confident in the result. And I haven't even gotten to the point where I've gotten to talk about things like the watching the bending of light as it goes over the sort of roller coaster of curved space and, and spins around clusters of galaxies. There's a heap of other stuff out there as well, which makes us very confident in the result. But I'm going to skip over that because it's important, oh, those are, the, those are the curves. It's important to get to the, back to the question of why. Because believe it or not, some people do not find this stuff intrinsically interesting enough to do <laughs> just on its own merits. <laughs> so to those people, I say that, hey, look at this. We've discovered something that is accelerating the entire universe. If we can figure out what that is and maybe harness it, who knows, maybe we can make some clean energy for humankind. Or maybe if this, this anti-gravity stuff, we know what it is, maybe we can start to control gravity, you know? Hoverboards, anyone? <laughs> but, you know, those are pie-in-the-sky sort of ideas. We don't know whether those are going to actually happen. What we do know are the direct practical applications that do come out of our astrophysics research. For example, uh, some astronomers at the Parkes Radio Telescope they were attempting to find black holes using variable radio signals. Now, they went in and looked for these, to do, look for these black holes. They had to develop software that would process radio signals faster than had ever been done before. Now, long story short, they never found the black holes, but the software they developed now forms the basis of the Wi-Fi that is in every phone and computer in the world. Also, astronomers. We love digital cameras, and we love every single speck of light that we can possibly get on, to, on our digital cameras. That means we've developed some of the most sensitive cameras in the world. And uh, the techniques that we've used for imaging are now also being used in medical imaging and cancer diagnosis. Not only that, you saw before we're simulating the entire universe in a supercomputer. And the amount of d t data that things like the square kilometer array are going to produce um, is more data than the entire internet traffic at the present time, when that eventually gets built in like a decade's time. So we're pushing the envelope in supercomputing, and that kind of thing is now being used in a lot of fields as well. So there's a lot of practical applications there. But to finish with, I, would come, I was going to come back to a bit of a question. So we've found that 95% of the universe is in a form that we can't see and we don't really know about yet. Uh, is this something that should intimidate us or humble us or what do you think? I, I actually think it's the opposite because it's a strength, not a weakness, that we've now understood the universe enough to be able to notice that these things exist. And as one of my favourite science fiction authors, Frank Herbert, once said, uh, the beginning of knowledge is the discovery of something that we do not understand. Thanks very much.